Hi, Steve. Hey, thanks for agreeing to do this video interview with me today over Zoom. For our audience, would you please introduce yourself and give us a little bit, uh, you know, let's start off with where did you grow up? Um, my name's Steve Viachica. I'm an associate professor of organizational performance and workplace learning at Boise State University. I grew up in Golden, Colorado, uh, a small place outside of Denver and probably more famous as the home of Coors beer than anything else. Here, here, cheers to that, uh, yes. So uh, where did you go to school? What did you study? I um, started uh, university work at the University of Denver. I quickly ran out of money. I transferred to the University of Northern Colorado my sophomore year. At first, I thought I was going to be a high school uh, debate coach. And so I was focused on uh, English and a teaching certificate. And late in my university uh, tenure, I was taking my last methods course and realized that I really did not want to teach in a high school. Um, that led to uh, graduating and not necessarily knowing what I wanted to do. Uh, finding a job uh, tutoring English at a community college. And um, that was enjoyable. Uh, I really liked community colleges and that's where I first started realizing I liked working with adult learners. That led to um, going back and getting a master's degree from the University of Northern Colorado. Uh, from there, uh, my uh, first internship at IBM, uh, I was the world's worst intern. Uh, it was not a good fit for IBM. It was not a good fit for me. But again, I really liked working with the uh, adult learners. And from there, uh, the, uh, the Macintosh had just come out. Up until then, I was working with Apple to ease. Uh, and I convinced my brother to buy a Macintosh so I could use it to put together my portfolio. And uh, a little portfolio on uh, teaching word processing to college students landed me my first uh, ID job at McDonnell Douglas. Um, they were my first real formal introduction to ID. Thank you, Jackie Dobrogoni. Uh, but it was also a mismatch uh, in that it was a real large organization. And uh, I started applying for work uh, in ads uh, and this post office box kept coming up and the, you know, the job descriptions varied a little bit, but I, keep, I, I kept on responding. And it ends up being that that was DLS group. And <sighs> after a year and a half at McDonnell Douglas, uh, I started working with Deborah Stone and DLS Group, and I worked for them uh, just shy of 20 years. Uh, during that time, uh, when I first started off, a lot of our work was uh, software systems training. And um, DLS Group already had a pretty darn good performance-based training approach for software systems training. Um, but as, you know, mainframe started to go by the wayside. Uh, we also saw the rise of the knowledge workers and suddenly everyone's a knowledge worker. And that led me going back to school. Uh, by this time, my bride had found employment at UNC, the University of Northern Colorado. So I completed my doctoral work there on the friends and family price structure, which was really helpful. And uh, in 2007, a job opened up in the, uh, what now is the Opal Department. We say Opal because Idaho is the gem state. <laughs> okay. uh, opened up at uh, Boise State and I've been here since then. Now ISPI has a relationship of some sort with, with Boise State. Um, and with, with how, so is, how did you get introduced to Boise State itself? Uh, was it through that connection? It was through ISPI. 
Uh, and so what was really nice is uh, because of ISPI's research committee, uh, I'd already met a lot of the faculty. Uh, I'd met uh, David Cox, I'd met Don Stepich. Uh, and then uh, later on, um, you know, when I first was in the research uh, committee, it was Will Tallheimer, who was the chair, then Mary uh, Norton Thomas and I mm -hmm. uh, were co-chairs. And then uh, Tony Marker and Linda Hugland, again from Boise State, took it on after us. And so we met uh, uh, over the phone and in some uh, pre-Zoom meetings. And so by the time that I heard about the opening for the job from uh, one of the uh, faculty members on a plane ride home from ISPI. And I started talking with my bride and, and said, what about Boise? And she said, well, that could be good. And uh, so uh, we've been here since and uh, ISPI uh, is the place where we meet our students because OPAL is an all online master's program. And ISPI has been um, the conference where we get to have uh, FaceTime with our students. And it's the conference where uh, we traditionally uh, have been able to meet most of our students during the conference. So we have our own uh, OPAL dinner during the ISPI conference. Yeah, now you and I met uh, back when ISPI was MSPI. I was thinking about this earlier. It must be 30 some years ago. It's uh, we. We kind of go way back, I think. I think um, it's got to be a long time ago because uh, my first conference was in 89. And I'm pretty sure I met you either then or shortly after that because Deborah Stone uh, took me around and introduced me to everybody that she knew, which was one of the greatest professional gifts ever. Yeah. Yeah, I always, I always uh, liked her, and I, I've sat in on many uh, presentations that you guys have done. You've done some very interesting work, so let's try and cover a little bit of that. So in this career progression, now some of the work that you have may be top secret, and you you know, you know, couldn't tell us unless you could kill us afterwards, but what? so what are some of the more interesting projects that you've had that you know, deal with instruction or performance improvement or both? What, what can you share with us? Um, with uh, DLS group, um, we worked uh, primarily with uh, Fortune 100 companies and also we did some work in national security. Uh, we did a lot of uh, performance-based training. Uh, I think uh, that's what uh, Deborah Stone cut her teeth on as an ID working at Fort Huachuca years ago. And so performance-based training and large-scale curriculum development. And you know, in our field, there are not a lot of people with those chops, you know, you no. being the other one that comes to mind. Uh, uh, and so um, uh, we did uh, um, training for computer software systems and uh, e-learning for, um, uh, people in banks who were up selling products and so on. Uh, I think our more interesting work was in uh, performance support systems. Uh, this has since kind of morphed into workflow learning and support now, and it travels under a variety of names. Uh, it morphed into apps, you know, an app to do that. Um, when we were doing this, uh, people like Gloria Geary and Barry Raybald and so on were involved. And our biggest uh, effort was for people who regulate uh, securities firms that trade on the NASDAQ. And that involved a large scale performance support system that included uh, different types of skill training uh, using different uh, media, uh, including, uh, and approaches, including um, self-paced training, including uh, low fidelity simulations. These people audit securities firms. And so uh, they go through uh, preliminary training on how to conduct these audits. Uh, and they you know, do this in uh, self-paced training. They do it in instructor-led training. And finally, they reach a point where uh, 
they do this low fidelity emulation where they have to work together in teams and they have to audit this simulated uh, securities firm. So they have to go in and essentially they have to figure out um, does the firm actually have enough money to be trading securities and are they violating the, the sales rules? Are they conforming with sales rules? And so we set that up using uh, both company employees and they hired in actors. Uh, we also were able to set up, uh, use Margot Murray's work and set up a formal mentoring system as well. Uh, and that was the training component. But in addition to the training, uh, we found in our needs assessment that uh, these auditors uh, were responsible for creating their own personal libraries of auditing stuff. And literally they were putting little uh, uh, papers and folders and file boxes in the trunk of their cars when they went to an audit. And when they're in the middle of an audit and they were missing something, they call their friends and on the uh, fax machines of the folks they're auditing, they get the missing material. Uh, we also found out that the auditing process itself was paper-based and highly cumbersome. So we, uh, parts of the performance support system included uh, an online information system and that online information system was based on the results of a cognitive task analysis where we uh, embedded with the auditors and discovered the questions that they most use to orient themselves to new, pro new securities products. And it also led to the creation of uh, exam software that went on their laptops. And so instead of conducting an examinations and filling out lots and lots of papers, it all went online. Uh, you know, this is the 1990s and this is considered revolutionary at the time. Uh, but it was a really fun project and it was nice to be able to do it at a scale where we were able to reduce uh, ramp up time to competent job performance. Uh, before we started working with them, uh, it took two and a half years for a new auditor to come up to speed. And that's significant because most uh, typically their job tenure is five years because after five years working with the regulators, they switch jobs and they began working for the brokerage firms as compliance officers where they can make big bucks. And so half of their job tenure was spent coming up to speed. And our initial target was to decrease that to one and a half years. And we were able uh, to go from two and a half actually down to one uh, by the time we were conducting summative evaluations at the end of the project. Uh, that was fun. Uh, we also did uh, work with uh, performance support, exploring uh, uh, and prototyping design con concepts for uh, national security. Uh, that's all I can say about that. And uh, the last project I worked on uh, with uh, DLS group uh, was really fun. It was a cognitive task analysis for the California Commission of uh, Peace Officer Standards and Training, uh, California Post. Every state has a post uh, group for peace officer standards and training. And our job was to represent what detectives across the state do when they conduct criminal investigations. And uh, so uh, we used a number of different cognitive task analysis techniques. And we were able to um, use a, a variation on uh, task analysis to represent that. Uh, and then we used those representations to uh, conduct a job analysis to verify uh, the higher level duties. Uh, and we were able to begin uh, prototyping some of the training that could be associated with this. And then uh, right after getting all that work done, the uh, one of the two uh, project clients retired and he had pulled in every favor he had to be sure we were able to embed, uh, bring in detectives from around the states who had worked on, had a lot of experience in different kinds of crimes. And uh, with those personnel changes and my leaving for uh, Boise State, uh, we weren't able to pursue that work any further. Uh, I've been at uh, Boise State since 2007. 
uh, we're an on we are now an online master's program. And uh, in that time, I've taught our foundations course, uh, course on job aids. Uh, I'm currently teaching courses in, in uh, performance based instructional design and needs assessment. Uh, I enjoy teaching those uh, courses because uh, the needs assessment and the ID course involve our students working with real world clients doing real world work. And um, over time, we notice that it's sometimes hard for students to find clients who have skin in the game, quoting Mark Rosenberg, who are actually really willing to meet the sponsoring responsibilities that a collaborative project space requires. Right. And so uh, what's been great there is we've been, uh, I've worked with my OPAL colleagues and we now have strategic partners uh, who are local nonprofits. Uh, so uh, one is our food bank, another is a youth ranch that works with uh, at risk uh, kids and their families. Uh, we have other partners. Uh, one is a no kill uh, dog rescue. Another is the local humane society. Uh, we've done work with the local library system and we're also doing work with Boise State's uh, HR department. Uh, and what's great is all of these um, relationships are uh, supporting these nonprofits. Uh, students can still qualify their own projects and work on them, but if they can't, they have one of these. And what's nice is, you know, all of these projects are also associated with service learning, which means, you know, the university's learning experiences are aligned with uh, benefiting the community. And there's also a good karma element to these. And best yet, all of our strategic sponsors have track records for being really good sponsors to their student teams. And uh, our rule is that when we negotiate potential projects, uh, we keep going until everybody wins. It has to be good for the sponsoring agency. It has to be good for the client has to be good for their mission and the people, the agents, or the critters, the agency serves. It has to be um, good for our OPAL students. It has to be good for the course and support the course's learning outcomes. It has to be good for the department, Boise State, and the community. And when we're able to hit that sweet spot where everybody wins, we're able to have some really great projects uh, for our students. And I take particular pleasure in noting that our students Many of our students first experience with uh, performance based instructional design or their experience with uh, needs assessment is going to be with an organization who takes that sponsorship responsibility seriously. Uh, my research has focused on um, These weird transitions between academics and the workplace. Uh, so around 2014-15, I was working with a colleague in the psych department and we were putting together skill summits where we brought in uh, university people in the same room with business folks with the idea of targeting um, especially uh, uh, soft skills and some of the technical skills uh, for local jobs and with the idea of having more alignment. Um, there and uh, that eventually led to uh, finding these nonprofit sponsors. Uh, I've also uh, recently been working with uh, those sponsors and a colleague, uh, Rob Anson, who is Professor Emeritus from uh, IT and Supply Chain Management, and one of our graduate students, Jody Mamenga. And we've been doing um, process work with the local food bank. Um, here in Idaho, the population has been growing by leaps and, and bounds uh, along that property valuations and rent. Uh, and so the state's population was already growing. Uh, and with that, the number of food insecure people coming into the state. And um, then comes COVID. And because uh, we, Opal had already worked with the food bank to do uh, 
needs assessments and to stand up student pro uh, projects, we were talking and one thing led to another and the connection network flourishes. And uh, we were suddenly working with them uh, to do uh, process mapping. And so uh, we first uh, uh, worked with the people at the docks who received the donations. Then we worked with the people who actually uh, um, get the donations, the acquisitions group. Uh, we worked with the people who repack the donations and we're getting ready to do the uh, uh, work with the people who distribute it. And in the course of this, we um, realized, you know, we were almost reincarnating Geary Rumler's work, you know, because when we first started our, you know, and I'm guilty of this, my perception was kind of based on their perception of the organization. And it was highly siloed. Uh, it wasn't until we'd worked with a number of these groups that we realized that no, there isn't an acquisitions process, there isn't a receive process, there isn't a distributor or repack process. There's one process, it's called food flow, and it cuts across all of those departments. And um, we've been lucky enough to uh, be working with their executive suite, their uh, CEO, their COO, um, and their CFO. Um, have been incredible sponsors uh, and it's been a marvelous relationship and you know I grew up uh, kind of poor and there were times my family has been on food stamps and it's really nice to be doing this feed forward where we're able to help the food bank better serve its mission in these times. Um, that had us thinking to the point where we are now working to stand up a process management lab where we can offer this service to other nonprofit uh, organizations. And the reason is that they're typically caught in a horrible kind of dilemma where um, they're focusing on the mission and anything that isn't the mission comes at the expense of the mission. So uh, quite often uh, the mid to smaller to mid-sized groups we're targeting um, don't have infrastructures to support workplace performance. And so they rely on tribal lore, they rely on informal mentoring, they um, rely on meeting compliance requirements, but not necessarily supporting the performance underneath the compliance. And so uh, we offer a mechanism for them to um, build that infrastructure in ways that benefit the nonprofit who they serve, but also benefit our students by giving them work experience. And part of the agreement for this uh, process management lab we're forming is that they are agreeing to let us use the deliverables and share them. Uh, so when you get into process management, you know, most of that is considered, you know, proprietary. That's the yeah. secret sauce. That's the mojo. And what's marvelous is that part of the negotiations we're able to uh, work through with the food bank and we want to work with uh, future clients on is, you know, we want to be able to use these deliverables and make them available to students and make them available to scholars. And so again, it's everybody wins. And that's why I giggle on the way into work. I get to do cool stuff. I work with cool people. I get to do cool things. Life is good. That, I, I am so proud of you. I am so proud of, uh, you know, many of the people that we share as uh, mentors and, and uh, thought leaders that uh, have influenced our work. And it's just so cool to to hear this brought to fruition. It just, it makes me think about the uh, the late Roger Kaufman, who we just lost months ago, and uh, Mega, you know, social responsibility. And uh, uh, I, I think that's really cool. I, so I was thinking about, you know, what follow up questions do I have because you said a lot of things. But I, I so my last question was, was going to be about students being involved in this uh, lab. And uh, you answered that question. And I thought that's really cool. What a great experience. And I think it's lacking from uh, what little I know about other programs uh, in instructional design and performance improvement, but uh, this is uh, this sounds like a great opportunity, and it's online, and so people can uh, 
you know, more easily participate in the university's program and in, mm -hmm. are they doing all these, this work with the local community virtually? They must be, right? Uh, yes. And so uh, we've been all online since uh, 2012. And so uh, we have some students in the Treasure Valley, which is, you know, our fancy name for Boise and the local environs. <laughs> okay. Uh, but most of our students are located throughout the U.S. and increasingly they're located throughout the world. And so uh, we do this all virtually. Uh, and along comes COVID. Uh, so right now on all of our student projects, uh, when we negotiate this, uh, these efforts, uh, part of it is uh, for the things that we set up, uh, an agreement with the client that they don't expect anybody on the team, even if they live locally, to set foot on site. Uh, now, if someone on the team chooses to do that, and if they meet the sponsor's COVID protocols, it's okay. Uh, so we've been uh, uh, facile at uh, working uh, projects where sometimes there are local boots on the ground in that project team and other projects where nobody sets foot on the client premise. It really affected us in process uh, mapping. Uh, the first uh, uh, round of this, the first uh, set of workshops uh, we did on site at the food bank. Along comes COVID. Well, we ain't going to do that no more. Uh, so we spent our summer uh, doing a uh, feasibility study uh, to determine how we were going to do this virtually. And we ended up settling on a combination of Zoom and Mural. And that's how we were able to uh, complete the remaining workshops. And that's how we're going to do the upcoming workshops. Uh, we also have been using this as a prototyping opportunity because we wanna take what we're doing in the process lab, uh, process management lab, and eventually offer a course in this as well. And we had to figure out how to teach this stuff virtually by doing it virtually. Very cool, very cool. So, I, so earlier you mentioned uh, CTA, Cognitive Task Analysis, you mentioned it a couple of times. And uh, so for our audience, can you give us a, a short description of, you know, what the heck is Cognitive Task Analysis and how do you do it? What, what's in the secret sauce of, of figuring out, you know, what people are thinking, the covert behaviors that you can't see that are really necessary to teach people how to do stuff? Um, you, you hinted at what cognitive task analysis is for. It, it's to uh, make invisible thinking that underlies performance visible. Uh, and it serves the larger purpose of task analysis, which is to represent exemplary or successful performance. Uh, and the question becomes, how do you represent successful performance when a lot of it's going up here and you're not necessarily able to see what people are overtly doing. Um, so cognitive task analysis is a mashup of uh, traditional task analysis and uh, these other methods. So people have used different approaches. So uh, in her work, uh, I think she was working with national security analysts who were looking things up. Ruth Clark did a lot of what's called protocol analysis. So uh, she had people actually doing searches and as they were doing searches, she asked them to do think alouds. Uh, she recorded and analyzed the think alouds and was able to uh, then start putting together what people were visibly doing with the thought processes, how, uh, you know, involving situation recognition, uh, complex decision-making, things that are a little more complex than an if then or uh, if and then, um, and um, problem solving, you know, the heuristics that are guiding their, their solutions. Um, the uh, Dick Clark has used it a lot, uh, working with uh, inside of uh, medicine, specifically surgeons. And so he talked about uh, how surgeons are typically taught during, with a uh, watch one, uh, do one, teach one, or some variation on that. And then they started using cognitive task analysis um, uh, involving, I think, some similar data collection methods. 
and um, we're able to have surgeons coming up to speed better and making fewer mistakes while being faster. Uh, the way uh, we used it at the LS group uh, is a big shout out to uh, a couple things. One, uh, in the 90s, the Air Force experimented with this. And what they wanted to do was to get their avionics text, uh, technicians up to speed faster. And one of the big problems with avionics is that you're troubleshooting and troubles you know, happen at their own rate. And so if you are waiting for someone to get experience with all the different troubles they can encounter, you can wait a long, 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 long time. And so uh, uh, Les Gold and his companions wanted to uh, figure out how to decrease that ramp up time. And so uh, they used a cognitive task analysis technique called PERI. And what they did is they had these uh, techs actually troubleshooting. And when they were troubleshooting, they engaged in this protocol where it was, um, you knew what they had just done, which is the precursor P. Now, what are you doing? That's the A, the action. Um, what just happened? Those are the results, R. And then finally, what's your interpretation of those results? I, so that's Perry. And using Perry, they created uh, a computer-based training program that shrank time to competent performance simply because they were able to get experience solving one kinds of you know multiple kinds of troubleshooting very very quickly. Um, one of the nice things, um, one of the incredibly smart things that Deborah Stone always did at DLS Group, is uh, she used owning her own company as a way to bring in any kind of expertise we needed. And so uh, when we started looking at the work we were going to be doing with the detectives in particular, uh, we pulled in Rob Fauché and Ken Silber who had just written that text on, along with Mike Stelnecki, on uh, how to teach just about anything to anyone. And uh, it, we worked with the two of them and Rob had come up with a variation on uh, uh, Perry that was a little more client friendly. And so uh, instead of uh, P-A-R-I and it's kind of weird jargon, I think uh, we used uh, inputs. What are the things you see are seeing? Uh, questions. What are the things in your head that you're trying to answer now? Um, uh, what are the, some of the decisions you're making? And then finally, what are some of the outputs? And so we used that approach working with the, uh, the cops and we were able to embed that in a procedural task analysis. So we were doing task analysis the same way just about everyone else has done, right? You decompose a task. You know, so the task is, you know, uh, change a tire. Uh, the task is decomposed into duties, you know, uh, get your tools, jack the car up, swap tires, set it down. The duties are decomposed into subtask and those are decomposed into steps. That's the same as it always was, but there are going to be times where you hit decisions and you need to make a decision. Uh, some decisions are really uh, simple if-thens and the brilliant if-then tables that Joe Harless loved or you know the, multi the multiple column table work really, really well. And so you use those where they're appropriate. Uh, conversely, you use these complex decision tables where they're appropriate. And so in our task analysis, we'd go through and get the procedural analysis done first. Then we'd go through and we'd look for cognitive verbs, you know, evaluate, assess, uh, explore, uh, determine. Uh, and every time we saw one of those, we'd ask our subject matter experts, uh, what kind of a decision is this? and does the target audience already know how to do it? And there it was a pretty straightforward matter either to not provide anything because they already knew how to make the, the decision or to use an appropriate uh, simple or complex decision table. And we'd work with them on the spot to craft those tables. Very cool. So is CTA part of the program at Boise State? Or I um, because it's more advanced, no. Uh, but our teams are doing real work with real clients and occasionally they run into those situations. 
-hmm. So it sometimes comes up in uh, project teams and it can sometimes come up in work experiences. Cool. I remember reading the, the book that uh, Fauché and, and uh, Ken and uh, Michael put together. Is it Michael? Yeah, I, Michael Stone personally, but uh, but I have met him a couple of times. But they they had a book on cognitive task analysis, right? You referenced just another book. They referred to it in how to teach anybody anything, and they had uh, uh, structures for teaching troubleshooting and trouble and uh, structures for uh, problem solving. Okay. It's, it's been a while since I've read that book, and uh, I think uh, it's one of those books that walked away, somebody borrowed it, either I lent it to them or they came and lent it to themselves and uh, it's disappeared for good. So um, They're like, uh, yeah, I, I really enjoyed that book, and uh, I've been talking with Dick Clark a lot about uh, his approach to cognitive task analysis and uh, you know, trying to demystify it further because I think it's, it's so critical one, that people do analysis before they do design, before they do development. And uh, that if you don't have some strategies and tactics for doing the cognitive task analysis, then you're gonna be missing way too much. And you know, it's back to informal learning, social learning, which isn't always the most effective or efficient way to learn things especially if they're, if they're uh, regarding, you know, high stakes performance or, you know, just things that are critical and uh, to, you know, ultimate success downstream. Now, but let me shift gears here a little bit. Thank you for uh, sharing all of that. that was, that's fascinating. And I'm jealous of the students that you guys have there at Boise State because I'm one of these informal uh, instructional designer types who uh, came in through some side door and uh, <clears throat> have, have had to climb the learning curve uh, quite differently. But so, and I climbed it, you know, at NSBI and then later that became ISBI, but I always hearken back to the days of NSBI because that's when uh, in 1980, when I started uh, learning all this. But I wanna, I wanna explore a little bit about your first exposure to what I'm calling in this video series, HPT, Human Performance Technology. Of course, it's known as Human Performance Improvement by the ASTD, ATD crowd. Uh, and it's known as other things too, high performance organizations. I mean, it's got a lot of different names uh, for this uh, set of uh, methods and techniques and, and et cetera for doing improvement. But where did you first get exposure to this? Was it when you joined with, with Deborah or was it uh, uh, at school or, you know, so, so where, when and where was this? And who were some of the most early influences that you would mention uh, as a means to point uh, our audience to some of those early influences? Um, it was Deborah Stone, that yeah. DLS group. And so um, the job position read instructional designer. Uh, and I thought I'd come in as an instructional designer. She said, you really don't have the chops for that. You know, you'll come in as a junior instructional designer. Uh, but if you do well, well, you know, you can promote rapidly. Is that okay? Okay. Uh, and so uh, I came in as an instructional designer and I think, she, you know, she'd been working with me uh, several months uh, to help me ramp up on just the ID alone. And one day, uh, it was a Friday afternoon uh, and she popped a gin and tonic on my desk. And uh, she said, uh, you know, uh, there's this thing uh, that I've been involved in uh, because her mentor was uh, Ron Fillinger. And Ron Fillinger had introduced Deborah to uh, NSPI and performance technology. And Deborah was telling me about it. You know, she said, you know, if you look at what's happening in organizations, you know, there are a lot of different kinds of challenges. And, you know, training, the kind of training we do is good for one of them, but there are a lot of other challenges. Huh? I have a passion for learning. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, she, uh, you know, walked through, you know, what it was. Uh, she walked through how we did it. Um, and, uh, she, you know, DLS group, you know, was an earlier 
uh, an early adopter of that performance improvement angle. Uh, it was, you know, from a, a business model, it was good to be able to uh, expand the range of pain points that we could help our, our clients address. Um, and then, uh, you know, this is 1987. Uh, Around uh, 1988, uh, the local uh, Front Range chapter of ISPI uh, was selected to host the uh, annual conference. And uh, Deborah was part of that, and I forget her title. And one of my uh, professors from the University of Northern Colorado, Ellen Wagner, was part of that. And since um, Deborah owned the company, you know, we, uh, we helped uh, with some of the conference planning and so on. And um, I uh, attended as a uh, volunteer. And my first volunteer experience was with uh, Sharon Schrock and Bill Coscarelli uh, in the Criterion Reference uh, uh, Assessment uh, Workshop they did. And that's where Deborah introduced me to all these people in the field. And um, so what started happening uh, then it also is, I learned from Deborah that every time we start a new project, we build some internal money into a literature review. And we review the literature to see what's come out relevant to an, you know, this new thing we're doing and how might we want to uh, draw on this uh, new uh, knowledge in our work. And so, um, from that, you know, started bringing in more and more of the HPT folks. And I remember, um, you know, uh, Deborah and I planning out, you know, sessions we were going to see and, you know, uh, sitting in on Gary Rumler's uh, sessions together. Session. I, that would be my annual booster shot, as I used to tell them. I'm sitting in the front yeah. here. Because it's easier to harass you, but it's also you know less distracting if you're sitting way up front. But and I also get to ask my questions. Yeah. Uh, uh, and so uh, that was cool. And then uh, the other thing that happened is as this uh, performance support thing grew, you know, because suddenly uh, people like uh, Gloria Gary were doing it. Barry Raybould was doing it. Gary Dickelman was doing it. And uh, the Coast Guard was doing it. You know, in the US Coast Guard, uh, we're lucky enough to uh, get enough, uh, get a number of their students who are going through our program. They complete it in a year. Uh, and um, they are phenomenal students. And it's so nice having a leader in performance technology as part of our student base. Uh, you know, and this is way back in the 90s when all of this is new and interesting. And so, you know, we'd go into the Coast Guard sessions and see what they're doing with performance support. They'd come into our sessions and uh, it was a, a whole bunch of cross uh, pollination. Um, the other uh, influence on that um, started shortly around that time as we were, you know, exploring uh, instructional changes. You know, we can't just rely on behaviorism anymore if you're teaching, you know, uh, highly cognitive skills. Uh, and so I uh, uh, met uh, Dave Jonathan through the local uh, Front Range ISPI chapter. And his work in uh, problem solving and instruction uh, is just amazing. You know, the guy classified uh, different kinds of problems and suggested instructional techniques for all of them. Um, and, you know, he's one of those we lost way too soon. Um, I also remember uh, in 1989, uh, I'm at my first conference, and I come up with the brilliant idea of Allison Rossett's book on training needs assessment had just come out. So I bought a copy, and, you know, I'm real scared, and I walk up to Allison, would you sign your book, please? And that's how I met Allison. And, uh, you know, the training needs assessment book was revolutionary at the time. And, you know, since then followed all of her work as well. Um, but, you know, these are the broad folks that have struck me. Also you, uh, you know, you've always been a voice about performance-based training. And um, also how you manage these performance improvement efforts in ways that uh, muster the collaboration 
uh, from the client side group and the project side group in ways that you're able to pull all this magic off. You know, one of our biggest challenges in performance improvement is um, when we have client support to use all of our, our magic, you know, permission to use our mojo, yeah. we can do yeah. amazing things because suddenly we're able to work in ways that uh, align with our standards and that align with our ethics. Uh, all too often, uh, we don't have those kinds of permissions. And if we don't have those kinds of permissions, then what we can do is very limited. We often tend to kind of fall into uh, the best we can do solutions that may not uh, be the more effective or the more, worse yet, the more valued solutions. That, that is so true. That, uh, I, I think I learned that when I was, especially at Motorola, because I was dealing with uh, 30 manufacturing operations managers and they were a really tough crowd. I mean, they told, when I used the word exemplar, they said, guy, we hate that word. It's a third, it's a $3 college word. We hate it. And I said, well, how about master performer? So, and, and, and then I worked with them and then we, I had a pilot session that failed because I listened to the corporate SME for purchasing who I didn't know until after the pilot failed that he had been seven years out of the field. So he didn't know what was current. And so I asked for an exemplar and that's when they said they hated that word and I said master performer I want somebody who's doing you know doing the job and what my, what I learned from all of that is that I I learned to call my interactions with them I I borrowed a, a, ter, a phrase from the quality movement uh, gate review meetings and I would tell my clients in the very first one because they hated being there they hated that there was going to be more of these meetings and I said I, this is a command and control structure for you and they would all go, oh, well, we like the sound of that because, you know, we, mm -hmm. when we're not in control. And I would say, but it's also an empowerment mechanism for me because once you agree what I'm going to go do, then I've got license to go do it. And I may need your support because if it's really important to do otherwise, let's just shut the whole thing down. And they would go, well, what do you need to shut it down here? You're a consultant. You're not supposed to say things like that. But so yeah. darn hard for most practitioners working on most, you know, the, the typical average project, which isn't about high stakes performance, you know, and if you're a consultant being brought in, you're working on something that's usually a little bit on the higher stakes level than low stakes mm -hmm. performance. And, but it's so hard to get, get people to, you know, work with you, to collaborate with you, to get the resources that you need to make the business decisions inherent in all of this, mm -hmm. because there are plenty of them. Well, oh, that's and cool. as external consultants, I think it's easier for us to get to that sponsorship. Yeah. I think for internal employees, it can be a lot harder. Um, and before I forget, uh, other positive role models, uh, Ruth Clark, you know, every book she's ever written on uh, evidence-based training and related aspects. Uh, when uh, we needed at DLS Group to restructure uh, what we were doing for performance support and for working with knowledge workers, we had to uh, look at a very different set of processes and a different uh, management structure. And so we borrowed uh, rapid application development from uh, James Martin. Uh, short name is RAD, but RAD is the uh, parent of Agile. And so RAD is what introduced uh, a software development methodology based on um, participative uh, analysis and design, uh, rapid prototyping, usability testing, uh, uh, special uh, people who are using advanced tools. And um, later on, Agile comes around and is able to harness that along with the, the techniques and, and the concerns in the Agile manifesto. Uh, and one other uh, very heartfelt call out is to your uh, former colleague, Grace Fenson. Um, we'd always, Deborah and I would always go to the session. Sometimes you were doing them together. Sometimes they were separately. Later on, uh, Ray was one of the few people at ISPI talking about process. So I learned a lot about process from Ray. Yeah. And um, it was interesting when we were in the middle of all those process changes, uh, 
Deborah was able to finagle uh, some high-end DOD process engineers, you know, people with ultra secret clearances and so on, who did work on uh, missiles. And uh, they helped us restructure our processes, which was great because they were at, actually on sabbatical. And they looked at us in our biggest project ever, it was, you know, like a million something. And, oh, that's so cute. <laughs> and so they helped us. But uh, later on, I, I came to Boise State and uh, I was working on an NSF grant, looking at how to speed up uh, ramp up time for newly graduated and hired engineers. And one of the things the grant explored was forming a coalition to do that. And we needed a business plan. And uh, I mentioned it to Ray because we'd been in correspondence through ISPI. He said, well, why don't you just come up here and I'll help you build one. And free of charge, uh, I traveled up to Billings, had a marvelous couple days at his place. And by the time we were done, uh, we had a business plan that Lynn Carney later illustrated for us. Uh, and, you know, uh, there's some people who have left us, Ray, you know, uh, way too quickly. And Ray is one of them. Dave Jonathan is another. And sorry to have seen them go. It, that's so true. I mean, you know, it's it's funny because a lot of the people that not everybody, everyone at ISPI that was kind of a thought leader, were, they were engineers. And Ray was a Bell Labs engineer back in the day when they only hire the top 10% of the engineering graduates from the top 10% of the engineering schools. And he was one of those. And he got bored as an engineer and he went into AT&T management and, and focused on strategic planning. And that's and he was doing strategic planning at Motorola with Bill Wiggenhorn when, when I met him and then I, and I left with, uh, to join Ray um, in this company. And he is one of the the, the my greatest uh, influences, uh, one of my mentors, because I, I learned so much from him, uh, kind of the engineering approach to things and breaking things down, work breakdown structures, and all that kind of stuff. It was just uh, so yeah, uh, it, you know, I, I, I didn't I don't know everybody that you just mentioned. And I don't know their work. But the, again, it's one of those issues when you're when you come in the side door, and you don't get formally educated and all this stuff. Again, I'm 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 extremely jealous of all your students, and if I wasn't such an old guy, I'd probably uh, sign up. And um, so let's let's shift gears here a little bit here. Um, as a way of an example for our audience, can you give us your thirty second elevator speech on what you do? Um, I've got one for performance based training and one for needs assessment. Uh, so I don't have a generic one for the full range of performance improvement. Uh, I think the reason for that is uh, it's too encompassing and it's too easy to get lost in our jargon instead of terms that resonate uh, with your audience of an elevator pitch. Uh, I recently had a student team that was completing a needs assessment for uh, the uh, the no-kill uh, dog shelter. And instead of calling it a performance gap, they called it a challenge. I'm going, yeah. Uh, so these are my attempts to try to talk about what we do without uh, pegging the jargon meter. So for performance-based training, it's, uh, and I'm gonna try to read these. Uh, we create training that builds skills. People need to perform job tasks in ways that meet an organization's strategic business objectives. We work with your best performers to represent how they think and work. We leverage these representations to create training and other support materials that help or, uh, others in the organization work more like these successful performers. We also work with the organizational stakeholders to make sure that whatever training we create transfers to the workplace so you can see it on the job. Excellent, I like that. Um, and that's taken a lot. Um, my uh, positive role models for writing in this field are Ruth Clark, Allison Rossett, and uh, Temple Grandin, who's not in our field. Uh, Temple Grandin was featured in one of Oliver Sacks's books. Uh, she is uh, 
uh, Asperger's uh, autistic. Uh, she teaches at uh, CSU and she writes about her experiences and she's a not another compelling writer. And um, I once asked Allison, you write really well. She said, thank you. I said, uh, how do you do that? She said, well, when I write, I imagine my parents in my head and I write for them. And um, since that time, I have tried to write more like Ruth, tried to write more like Allison, tried to write more like Temple Grandin every day. Um, and needs assessment, I've been working on this one because uh, it's interesting uh, when I'm scouting projects, potential projects, it's a lot easier to scout potential training projects uh, in these nonprofit organizations because typically there's so much done that's tribal lore and we're able to find a uh, sweet spot tribal lore issues where yes, it's procedural, it'll lend itself to a job aid, it'll lend itself to some introductory training. Um, those are easy. And, and what's nice is, you know, there's almost a never ending supply of them. Uh, needs assessments are harder to sell. One, because organizations don't need as many of them. Uh, but secondly, because the idea is more obtuse. And so here's the latest version of a pitch that's under constant refinement. Um, we help organizations address messy people problems and stand up new capabilities. We address organizational challenges and things that keep leaders up at night by removing barriers to desired performance. These barriers exist in the workplace environment when people lack access to adequate information, process, tools, and incentives. And they exist when individual people may lack motive or capacity or the skills to perform. Having identified these barriers, we work to identify and stand up feasible solutions that address the challenges. I like that as well. Under constant refinement, I guess, I guess that's the thing with elevator speeches. Uh, one, depending on your audience, you know, you got to watch your jargon, you know, save that for your conferences, but you know, otherwise speak in your best bedside manner and, and use plain English. Um, but it's a challenge for everybody. And that's why I ask for examples so that, you know, individuals that are watching this can, can work on, you know, well, how do they tell their story? Um, and, and how do they modify their story based on who that audience is, who they're talking to? And it's a challenge for people. It is, and I've come to realize that um, as a, a professor type, 75% um, of what my students get from me is, you know, pretty much the same thing everyone I would have worked with would get. You know, there are things that come out of the pen or the mouth of a senior ID or a project manager or, or something. 25% um, of what comes out of me is my responsibility to provide a safe and authentic uh, learning environment where people can master complex learning outcomes based on coaching and feedback and practice. Uh, and so there's an implication there that that's always been hard for me to um, uh, address. And that is among ourselves, we speak a highly rarefied jargon. And with our clients, we need to do something else. Now, uh, we need to use language they understand. And I love your phrase, bedside manner. Uh, interestingly, you know, we're part of Boise State's College of Engineering and engineering engineers who have to interact with non-engineers, you know, uh, will make the same kind of comment. Um, but uh, it's interesting, you know, our jargon uh, contains a whole bunch of the same terms that can mean entirely different things or related things. And we can use different terms to mean the same things. And we can use a whole bunch of college kind of uh, highfalutin terms to mean things that are relatively simple. You know, why we want to call it a performance gap when it's a challenge. And Strunk and White would say, always use a shorter word in place of a longer one. Uh, I don't know why we want to call it interventions. Uh, you know, it's like, you know, when I think interventions, you know, I'm thinking of, you know, bad cable TV reality shows and people that are hoarding or, you know, people trying to drive to work while doing math, you know, uh, our jargon defeats us, but it's my job to help students both 
come up to speed on our jargon, but also develop that bedside manner. And um, it's an ongoing challenge and one that I'm hoping to be addressing better as time goes on. You know, I know I've been working on it the 14 years since I came to Boise State. But our requirements are both. You know, we need to be able to converse among ourselves and we need to be able to converse with everybody else. I know that that's it's hard and, and it's so hard for people coming into the field because we have these, as you said, we've got these redundant terms, we've got overlapping terms and concepts, and we've got, you know, marketing spin on things. So, you know, what Rummer and Gilbert back in the 70s called yeah. guidance was later job aid, was later uh, electronic performance support systems, uh, quick reference guides, um, and performance support, and now workflow learning. I mean, what, what uh, are you doing to people? Yeah, uh, when I'm uh, scouting with projects, uh, we call those cheat sheets. <laughs> exactly. Uh, they, they know what that means exactly. So you got cheat sheets, you know, the 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 uh it's the post-it note that's worn off its stickiness and now it's using some sort of a tape yeah it's right up there by the monitor <laughs> exactly oh what fun oh <clears throat> we are uh we're our opportunity rich because we uh we have any problems we can address um so let me shift gears here a little bit to the next question as a lifelong learner can you share with us what you're currently focused on? What are you? What learning curve are you now climbing? Um, a real fun one, and that's uh, getting back into uh, process management. So at DLS Group, I was involved in some of the process management as we reworked our internal capabilities to provide new services to clients. Uh, I was also uh, lucky enough to work with uh, DLS colleagues on several. Uh, process related uh, needs assessments for uh, some high tech organizations. And so I have, you know, based on those experiences, based on the smart people whose works I have stolen and applied, um, I have some experience there. But uh, this work I'm doing now with the process, what will be the process management lab has really been fun. And I really am excited about it for a number of reasons. One, uh, because of uh, the notion that we'll only do the work if we are working with an organization's leadership and have adequate sponsorship. Uh, but the other thing that's been really nice in addition to this opportunity for students is that uh, in process mapping, after you map things out, uh, you start drawing on a lot of stuff that's common to our performance improvement methods. So where are the pain points associated with this uh, process? Where are the disconnects? For each one of the disconnects, there's a, a cause analysis. Now what's interesting, and the reason I'm, I'm really excited about this, is that when performance improvement people think about cause analysis, we tend to use our cause analysis models, whether it's Gilbert's VEM or Chevalier's updated version, whether it's Geary, Rumler's, um, there are lots and lots of people who have cause analysis models and there are, you have one. Uh, I've written one with Don Stefich. Uh, by and large, they're similar, but there's some important tweaks in them. Um, and, but typically because we're part of this performance improvement community, we look at things that are pretty standard across all of those models. Uh, the process people are really good at uh, look, identifying causes associated with a lack of standards identifying causes associated with the lack of feedback, identifying causes associated with process stuff. And, um, you know, things that we don't think about, like are we checking for quality afterwards as opposed to building it in? Are we constantly looking for ways to decrease the number of uh, steps? Are we, you know, are we using these kind of strategies to improve quality from day one, et cetera? Um, so they're really good at process. They're um, sometimes really good uh, with tools, especially if you've got a process person with some ergonomic chops. Now, sometimes you do and sometimes you don't. Um, and anything that doesn't kind of fit those, they tend to call uh, human error. And their default solution for human error is go send them to training. 
Now, what's nice is there's this sweet spot intersection here where we can help. Uh, we can get in there and say, well, let's talk about the guidance people have. So uh, with some of our clients, we've had these really interesting conversations about SOPs uh, that meet compliance burden, uh, but they don't actually represent the performance. And so one of the things our process management lab hopes to provide is the ability to write SOPs that actually capture uh, expertise and represent it. Um, and so um, uh, the area of guidance, uh, the area of uh, um, tool design, uh, process folks aren't necessarily good at user interface. Uh, and we know from the IT folks that are really uh, intuitive and predictable user interface that follows the workflow of a good process and the thought flow of a good process uh, can do wonders. So there's a way to partner there. We're really good at the messy consequences stuff. You know, as a consultant, I think we all have our safe bets that we can make walking into any organization sight unseen. My safe bet is within five minutes, I can find examples of consequences gone bad, where the organization is rewarding the behavior it doesn't want, it's punishing the behavior it wants, or behavior just don't matter at all. Uh, and we're helpful there. Uh, we're helpful in terms of looking at motives and more importantly, looking at the interaction between the motives that get people out of bed in the morning and the incentives, that formal part of the consequence mechanism. Uh, at DLS Group, uh, we once found out that uh, we prided ourselves on the degree of our medical coverage. And uh, one of our newly hired IDs, who was just a superstar, um, said, you know, I don't need insurance that good because I'm not old like you. What about giving me a benefit that, let me, uh, that would let me pursue a master's degree? Oh, duh. <laughs> uh, misalignment, right? Uh, incentives, <laughs> motives. Um, I think uh, capacity and the interaction of capacity and process and tools is a big issue now. One is COVID. The other is uh, the tendency I'm seeing for more and more job descriptions to be nothing more than fantasy. Uh, they may have been uh, accurate and complete and representative at one point, but they've slipped away since then. Uh, so, you know, we can help with uh, the capacity issue. We can help with that trade-off between individual capacity and what goes in the environment. Uh, and then, yeah, we, we can help with the, the skills and the knowledge. Uh, and so I'm looking at a more uh, unified, yet another darn cause analysis model, but hopefully one that's kind of taking some of the, the mojo and the magic they use uh, looking at the process related stuff and mixing it with what we do on the other stuff. So that's the stuff that uh, is having me really excited. The other thing that has me really excited is that our um, craft is uh, disgraced by the large scale practice of dump and run. Here's your needs assessment. Here's your training. We're done. And um, we're not doing the hard work to negotiate uh, for uh, orphans in our field, orphans such as good implementation, orphans such as uh, maintenance, orphans such as continuous improvement, uh, orphans such as transfer uh, of skill. And uh, one of the things that's been really neat in our work with the uh, food bank is their leadership is all over this because this is how they meet the mission in the time of COVID, right? Yeah. And um, we realized that uh, these folks are really good at their jobs. You know, the warehouse people are really good at, at, at this complex choreography of things coming in, you know, partial process, being in storage, waiting for repack, coming out of repack, needing to go to a staging area. Each one of these groups in, in their little silo, in their silos are incredibly good at their jobs. Um, when we mention that, you know, we've now worked together to organize these pain points and we've specified solutions for them, management now wants to hear, you know, how this is going. 
and oh, they all freak out. You know, the organization had never done that before. So uh, what's really nice is that their leadership was very receptive to the notion that this change management stuff doesn't, you know, isn't really, is just a means to an end. And you're not going to get the ends you want unless you're providing uh, the organizational support for the broad changes that are coming there. And so uh, we were able to work with them to help prep their uh, process leads for the presentations. Uh, they were very responsive in listening to us and they went out and actually hired a chief operating officer who's coming in with a whole bunch of process improvement and continuous improvement chops. Uh, it's just uh, great. So uh, that's another place that's been a really neat place to explore because I think until we police ourselves about, you know, getting out of this dump and run mentality, you know, we perpetuate the problem. And yes, clients don't always give us permission to do right by them, but I would argue it's part of our due diligence to do as much as we can. Great. Hey, I really love uh, this phrase that I've just written uh, uh, down on my piece of paper here. Uh, it goes along with workflow, but thought flow. I bet you'll be, you. I'm going to write about that. You haven't copyrighted that or trademarked that yet, have you? No, please uh, make it commonplace. <laughs> is, is this, who came up with this so I uh, do the accreditation correctly? Is Probably that... Deborah and me over a cocktail. <laughs> uh, I think uh, I've shared cocktails with you guys before uh, back in the day. Well, we should probably remedy that. <laughs> All right. Well, let me go on to my, my next question here. Um, and it has to do with our terminology and our language. And uh, I ask, you know, my question is, is there a performance improvement term or phrase that you would like to define for us? Perhaps you feel it's being misused or misconstrued and you just want to put your spin on it. And if you have more than one that you'd like to share, uh, you know, go ahead and do that. But uh, but I, I'm trying to help people understand that there's all this language issues and semantics issues that with that one faces when they're coming into the field. So what, what term or phrase do you have for us? I, well, I've got three. I already gave you one, which is our dump and run practice. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't, I think that's a disservice. Uh, the next uh, is our use of the term root cause of a performance gap. Uh, in my experience, performance gaps travel in wolf packs, and each gap has its own wolf pack of related causes, and those causes interact. And I think our job as practitioners is to conduct a needs analysis that's thorough enough to be able to say, here are the causes, and here's how the causes interact to produce the performance gap. Uh, one of the best examples I've seen of that in our published literature is Gary Rumler's work and his anatomy of performance. He's able to say, here's some stuff that's happening at the worker level, and here's how this gets manifested into a process that isn't up to snuff. And here's how that now is affecting the whole organization. Um, and he's not talking about uh, in that, those examples about you know one little single root cause you know, uh, which is the fault of everything. I think if you are uh, the, uh, the people who investigate airline accidents, uh, what is it, NT? Yeah, the, the Transportation Board or something like that. Yeah, NTSB. Uh, you can do a root cause analysis because it's going to come down to a switch that didn't fire or something that wasn't closed. But human performance tends to be a messy problem space. And I think problems co-occur. And the interesting stuff is in the multivariable uh, space, not trying to uh, inflate the value of one variable to the exclusion of the other. Um, the other thing is uh, I'm lucky enough to uh, work with a variety of really cool colleagues in our department. Uh, and you know that it's one of those true blessings. Um, one of my partners is uh, Lisa Lisa Giacomo, and one of the things that uh, she's made me a lot more sensitive about recently is um, a couple things. One, uh, there's 
a huge amount of variability in ID practices. So uh, we did some panel uh, dis discussions at a conference for the Association for Educational Communications and Technology. And uh, in the panel were the two of us and uh, some other IDs. One was a university dean. Uh, another was a industry employee kind of person like Lisa. Another was working with a, a school system. And we realized that all of us are going under the job title ID, but our day to day, what we do is profoundly different. Uh, moreover, when we expand that range and now we look at performance improvement, it's profoundly, profoundly varied. Uh, we have people who specialize in different aspects of it. We have people uh, who may do all of it, but at different scales, you know, uh, smaller efforts or huge efforts. And um, one of the things, uh, you know, she helped me realize is the variability of our practice. And related to that is, um, I think uh, people, especially like me, who come from that external consulting environment, need to be a lot more sensitive and careful in terms of how we position our practices. Uh, we're lucky because when organizations hire us in, there already is typically a pain point uh, that's sufficiently nasty for somebody to agree to most of our sponsorship requirements. And moreover, because we play in that space often, we're pretty good at negotiating for the sponsorship we need to deliver what we promise. Uh, and that's, you know, I was able, you know, working with Deborah, you know, almost 20 years to, you know, typically work inside of that space. Uh, if you are an employee in an organization um, that really hasn't aligned with professional standards, whether they're ISPIs or AECTs um, or our ethical standards, whether they're you know, from those organizations or APA or HR, uh, HRD and other professional organizations. Uh, I think we need to be careful about saying you should be, you should be doing this, you should be doing that. Our field demands. Um, uh, I think um, Lisa was quite, quite right when she pointed out to me that, you know, that approach, you know, is in fact a shaming approach. And I think instead of calling people out and dressing them down for not meeting our standards, for not meeting our codes of ethics. I think we need to, you know, realize that our shaming, you know, could be perpetuating some of the problems we complain about. Uh, and more importantly, it isn't going to help us necessarily get the traction in, um, you know, workplace supervisors, lower managers, mid managers, senior managers, executive suite, that we're really going to need to, you know, on a regular and common basis, pull out all of the, the uh, tools and all of the magic, you know, in our, you know, associated with our performance improvement craft. craft. So I think we need to, you know, spend more time uh, and finding ways to help them uh, build sources of organizational intelligence so that they understand how the organization works and how they can work the organization. And I'm stealing that from Ken Silber and Lynn Carney. And uh, uh, I think uh, we need to find ways to help them strategize how to move their particular organizations. You know, if I'm coming in as an entry level person and I'm expected to churn out um, e-learning and it doesn't matter that it's an information dump, uh, how do I start investigating the space around me to see if I can make or I can be part of a change in my organization? Or as one of our graduates, uh, a Marine uh, uh, said, you know, there are times you just got to realize that that hill just ain't worth dying for. You know, how do we help them navigate that choice? That's a profound choice. Uh, and, you know, given that notion of how to strategize change in the organization, how do we help them convince their bosses and other organizational stakeholders to embrace, you know, what we would call aspects of responsible performance improvement practice? 
And so instead of, you know, and I don't think we intentionally shame, I think we get on our high horse. Um, but I think we need to be aware that we are probably shaming people more often than we think. And that instead we need to apply our tools, our processes and our good hearts to partner with them to grow these capabilities. Oh, I, that resonates. I remember sitting in an ISPI uh, kickoff session where, where I felt that the presenter, somebody who's very well known, was was berating people for you know just wanting to do instructional design work when they needed to be looking much broader. And I and I thought, and I'm I'm sure I'm guilty of the same thing, but but we need to you know we need bricklayers and carpenters. Uh, and and plumbers, we do need general contractors. And if you aspire to be one of those, that's fine. But if you're just a bricklayer, you just need to do really good at that. And we shouldn't be expecting people to, you know, be, go beyond what their context uh, demands, insists on. And we need to recognize that people have certain constraints. And it's a lot of that are just expectational constraints of the, the people that you work for. You know, they want an information dump. They don't, you know, our goal is to get the e-learning out here. We don't care what it does. It's a dump and run kind of thing, as you said. Um, and, you know, we need to provide ways for people to develop themselves to meet their own personal goals, but also to deal with, with their organization as it is and help them determine what strategies and tactics might they use to nudge the organization to, to doing something better that isn't, you know, costly in terms of more time and, and more, you know, uh, more cost to, to, to uh, advance these kinds of things here. But, you know, so to me, it's always been the, the uh, working with the stakeholders. And I often found that, you know, most of the time there's more than one stakeholder, you know, you get a request yeah. that comes in a request a training intervention, you know, I'm using that word intervention, sorry. And, uh, but, but, and that's what they expect. And I learned a long time ago that they're probably wrong. They may be mostly right, but they're going to be wrong about, you know, what the issues are that need to be addressed. And I fought often to get my client to form what I called a project steering team of all the other stakeholders. My rule was, you know, who might come out of the woodwork, you know, nine months later and take exception to what we're doing and how we're doing it. You know, we need to involve them on day one. Now, that was always a push. My, my unsuccessful projects where I did something that never got implemented, it was because what I produced was big, hairy, complex, costly. It was, I, I thought it would address their issue and solve their problems. But if I hadn't taken a bunch of the right people along in the journey, it was it looked like overkill in the extreme. It looked like a whole bunch of big reports and everything, and they didn't know how we came to the to the final conclusion and and the plan. And so, it really, I thought it behooved me to to try to figure out who those people were and get them engaged to as great an extent as possible up early. And if they and if they wouldn't participate along the way in the gate review meetings. I needed to have them pick trusted lieutenants to attend those gate review meetings to, to, you know, so that that gave them the command and control. But then it was always about the communication that needed to go up to those very top people so that they would be aware of what was going on. They may trust the lieutenants that they picked, but when it came time to, you know, pay the piper at the end of the thing to implement it, they were often hesitant and, and leery of this and thought, oh, the consultants fooled my trusted lieutenants. Um, it's, it's, I mean, we're opportunity rich. We have so many challenges and especially for the new people coming in. So I think that that's good advice that we have to be careful about what we say and how we say it so that we aren't shaming people, but encouraging them to look for ways to, you know, improve their own situation given the constraints that they have. And, um, you know, maybe in your role as interviewer extraordinaire, uh, you might want to start asking people for the tricks they use to turn uh, situations around. So uh, how do you, uh, uh, I've done that in the webinars that are posted on our Boise State uh, Opal site. 
Uh, and one question was, how do you turn a request, uh, a well-meaning but ill-informed request for training into an opportunity to improve performance? Uh, I think there are other questions that we could be asking our um, established practitioners so that we can share more tricks, more heuristics, more guidance with people who are in situations where they're aspiring to build that uh, sort of sponsorship that would enable them to practice more of our field as opposed to smaller subsets. So what you just said reminded me of, this was uh, I think just before 1985 because Joe Harless wrote an article in Performance Improvement Journal or Performance Instruction Journal at the time. Uh, and, and he was at the conference and, uh, and he, he got up on the stage and I can't remember, I don't think it was a keynote or whatever, but he said, and, I, and don't say in your whiniest voice, are you sure it's a training problem? And he said, because that was what everybody was saying. Don't be an order taker. Don't, you know, you know, gotta, you gotta push back, you know, and, and he hated that. That, that, that was the advice that we were giving to people. He said, uh, sure, I can help. The answer, he said, is sure, I can help you. And I can help you a little more if you let me do this front-end analysis, his term, his phrase for that front-end stuff. Um, and yeah, we, we, we give, you know, well, <laughs> we are well-meaning, but we give poor advice to people um, as if, you know, it's as easy as one, two, three, and just change your mindset and your behavior and you'll be just fine. No, there's, it, that's, that's a, that's a tough thing. For, but I, but I like the idea of that. And maybe you'll partner with me and uh, starting a new video series to uh, talk with, with people about the challenges. So let's explore that a little bit uh, more sure. after we're done with this video. Let me, let me shift gears here again to, we're getting close to the end, but not quite there. So my next question is kind of a revisiting of what we may have covered a little bit earlier, but I'm looking for uh, names of people that uh, you, that were again influential to you, and I'd like to know, you know, how they, what their influence was, what their impact was to you, um, and if there's a personal story that can go along with that, so we can humanize some of these people. Now they don't have to be people that are generally well known across the field. That you may be just doing a shout out to. You know, some one colleague who who was had that impact with you. But uh, um, if you were to, if you were to sh talk a little bit about some of the uh, additional people that 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 uh, helped you along the way, you know, it, it, you can revisit some of the people you've already mentioned, or 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 cover new people. It's up to you. But who who might they be? Um, as I was preparing to answer that question, it, it struck me how, um, you know, what is that uh, folk song, All My Life's a Circle? And uh, recently I've been uh, coming back and reacquainting with people I have occasionally worked with and done things in the past. So, you know, you and I are chatting a lot more recently, you know, with your book publication and, and this uh, than we have for a while. Uh, and thank you. Uh, likewise, um, uh, Judy Hale invited me to her Economics of Ignorance conference, which was really nice, and uh, reacquainted with uh, Rob Fauché again. And um, several years ago at an ISPI conference, Rob and I were talking about his work, realizing that most of the writing in our field is um, he was talking about research in particular, but also about uh, things that go into project deliverables for us are really forms of argumentation. And so, you know, the notion is, can you uh, construct a prima facie argument? And so we have claims. What are the supporting uh, evidence for those claims? How do we weave those together? you know, using logic to have something that stands up to some sort of scrutiny. And um, I have a lot of students uh, who come into our courses, and I used to be guilty of this. Um, uh, university uh, composition courses like teaching people to write in long paragraphs, and they think that longer sentences are more intelligent than short, shorter ones. 
And if you're in engineering, they teach you to write in a nominalized form that uses lots and lots of passive voice. And so um, students come into my class and no, clients don't like reading stuff like that. So you're going to have to learn some ID writing techniques. And so uh, a call out to Rob who resurfaced, you know, when I needed him to provide that guidance about no, you're having to provide a rationale. This is about building an argument. What's the evidence in support of this claim? Um, and in Judy's conference, uh, he did a section uh, comparing um, belief-based practice to evidence-based practice. And what was nice is that in a few short minutes uh, and some uh, nice clear diagrams, uh, he had uh, a nailed version of that that was written in pretty much layperson language. Uh, just brilliant. Uh, likewise, uh, I've known Judy Hale for a long, long time. And uh, she was the one that first introduced me to the marvelous phrase, uh, the conference mafia. As I started presenting at conferences, and so I'd, I'd, I'd see you know, the whole host of us, not only at ISPI, but other conferences as well. Uh, so uh, anyway, uh, Don uh, Kirky and I uh, were teaching our needs assessment course last semester. And uh, our, we wanted to uh, bring someone in to uh, talk about, uh, especially the environmental scan, you know, how you start framing the performance gap in terms of uh, the levels of performance, but really the context, you know, how does this relate, you know, from the workers to the, the jobs and processes to the organizations to the larger society. Uh, both in terms of how this organization affects society, but how society also affects this organization. And Judy was uh, kind enough to uh, share her environmental scan tools with us. And that's now a webinar on our, uh, our OPAL uh, page. Um, but uh, it's a thank you, you know, for getting reacquainted again. And we're now using, uh, in addition to that environmental scan model of hers, um, in her 2006 uh, second edition of the performance uh, consultants field guide, uh, she brings out this uh, idea of intervention families and we're using those now in this course and, and our students are finding them helpful in that if you have these kinds of causes that are producing the gap, these are some broad intervention families that might address those causes and inside of those families, here are specific ideas that might work. And what's nice is it, uh, it's one of those pieces that uh, also provides guidance, going back to our friend, uh, Tom Gilbert, um, about um, how to select those interventions. And it has worked really nicely with other uh, practitioners work, you know, that picks up once you've selected some interventions, how do you work with uh, clients and other stakeholders? to find the feasible ones that could actually work in that organization. And so, you know, I've been in this field a long time and it strikes, you know, as I go through the circles, I'm so thankful for the people that are still here and I'm reconnecting with. Uh, there's so many I miss at each new conference. You know, sometimes, you know, uh, it's that they're retired and in retirement, you know, they're doing what they really, really want. And it's a happy story. Um, uh, and so many people seem to have graduated from a job to, you know, their happy place in retirement. Uh, there's so many others that have passed and some of them so young. And I think, you know, now that I'm older, uh, the circles, you know, are, important. And I really value this opportunity that we've had to talk. Yeah, thank you so much for that. So my my uh, final, we're doing a wrap up now. And uh, there's kind of a, 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 it's one last question. And it's, you know, do you have any parting words of wisdom or guidance for our audience, especially those who are new to the field related to all things performance improvement? So you deal with a lot of students. So I think you're speaking to, you know, the student population, but there's others who, who, for whatever reasons, can't join a formal program. 
but what guidance can you give to new people to help them as they begin this climb of that learning curve? Um, Deborah gave me years ago the sound advice of get involved in ISPI and get involved with their leadership. And um, I wouldn't be here without that connection. And so I think my advice is get involved uh, in the professional organizations that support our practices. Uh, and not only get involved in terms of being a member or participating in the, uh, the meetings or some of the workshops or the events, but also get involved in their leadership. Um, I, I think I learned more about how to manage people as part of the leadership of the Front Range chapter than in any formal training I ever had. And the reason was uh, in a volunteer organization situation, all you have is people's goodwill and their resilience. Uh, how do you work with that? How do you help uh, people find things that the chapter needs that they really want to do? How do you help them avoid things that they may want to do that might not be in there in the chapter's best interest? Uh, but it was a marvelous uh, proving ground. And while, you know, and I'm really young at this point, not now, uh, but uh, I also found mentors and people who were willing to, to help me and, you know, all sorts of different people from all sorts of different parts of our field. And I've maintained uh, those connections uh, for a long time. And uh, I, I think get involved uh, and get involved in the leadership. And so um, uh, our Boise State Opal Department uh, is part of now what is the Bay Area Boise State chapter of ISPI. And I encourage our students to uh, get, you know, to become a member, but also to become actively involved in the chapter because it's a place to grow leadership chops. It's a place to uh, work with the people who write our books. It's a place to find mentors and to learn cool things from really smart people. Um, I encourage them also um, as they're considering how to give back to their communities, you know, consider doing performance improvement work for the good volunteer organizations in your community. Um, one reason that we have settled on them uh, in terms of our OPAL strategic partners is that um, owing, you know, and probably to some of my limitations as a consultant, um, it was really hard scouting projects uh, sometimes in the workplace. And it makes a lot of sense. If you're a for-profit organization, you may not want uh, uh, students in a course uh, working with you know, essentially something incredibly confidential like your secret sauce. Um, if you're uh, trying to find uh, projects in uh, government settings, there are lots of regulations that can potentially get in the way. If um, you're, uh, interestingly, we've been able to do some pretty cool projects for the uh, US Coast Guard owing to our Blue Suitor students. And they've been a phenomenal sponsor, uh, always hoping to do more and always hoping to do other work uh, with our other people in the, the military services. Um, one reason that we have these relationships with our nonprofit sponsors is um, they're focusing on their mission and they don't have infrastructure and they're like a lot of others. And I think helping these worthy nonprofits build their infrastructure is a real feel good, good karma, good practice uh, space for us performance improvement people. And I encourage other people to do it as well. I, I think that's such good advice. I, when I, uh, I went to my first uh, NSPI chapter meeting back in September of 1979, and it was a 75 mile drive from Saginaw to Detroit. And I'm wow. back, it's, it's like 11 o'clock, 1130 at night, and, and there's three of us in the car and 
I'm new and excited about all these people that I've met and what I heard. You know, Danny Langdon happened to be the, the first speaker. And on the way back, I was told, oh, we signed you up for the newsletter committee. So <laughs> I got sucked in right at the very beginning. Uh, they, people don't tend to do this anymore. But back in the day, yeah, your boss would tell you, oh, I signed you up for this <laughs> this extra work outside of work and there's no extra pay. But And, and I... I've been so thankful that that happened to me, but but the but the advice of looking for for opportunities to apply and extend yourself, different from your work setting, with you know local groups that are doing things that that are resource constrained and can always use helping hands, and that may not be going in there to do instructional design or performance improvement work. It may be just lending a hand until you build some some credibility with those people that might entertain your thoughts about maybe mm -hmm. create some job aids or maybe we should look at our process and and reduce the you know the number of handoffs or whatever the issues might be as you first get in there and surveil what's going on and uh, you know extend yourself in in that kind of a, an approach but I so I think that's a that's excellent advice and it really rang true with me with what you said Steve, thanks so much for doing this interview here. I almost feel like we need to kind of do a part two because there's probably more that we could have gotten into. But uh, I appreciate you taking the time and and uh, doing this with me and sharing your thoughts and uh, and advice for others. Have a great day. You too. What a hoot. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Cheers. You too, friend.